Welcome to In Focus. I'm your guest host this week, Daryl Stranger. Melissa Ridgen will be back next week. Sport has been an important part of Indigenous lives across Turtle Island long before colonization, and it continues to bring our communities together today. Today we are putting sport in focus. I will talk to Ted Nolan about his hockey career both on and off the ice, and the challenges he has had to face at the highest level of the game. Also joining me today, James Lavallee and Joy Spearchief Morris. The pair are the recipients of the 2017 Tom Longboat Award, which recognizes Aboriginal athletes for their contributions in sports. And later in the show, former UFC flyweight champion Nico Montano. Montano was the first ever women's flyweight champion, and she is also an advocate for the Navajo Nation. We want to hear you join in on our conversation. You can tweet us at APTN in focus or email in focus at aptn.ca. Now, before we speak with Ted, let's take a look back at a story from 2018 when the Hockey Hall of Fame got some special new acquisitions, pieces that commemorate a team made up of mostly residential school survivors. APTN's Beverly Andrews brings us this story. <laughs> the legacy of the Saguing old timers now lives on at the Hockey Hall of Fame. Memorabilia from the team is now on display. Darlene Amo, along with community members and some former players, traveled from Winnipeg to Toronto to see it for themselves. My dad was the founder of the team, my mom was the manager, and my dad was the coach and I was the assistant to my mom and my dad and oh my gosh, there was a lot of work. <laughs> and just seeing, it just seeing the display at the Hall of Fame here, it was just like all those memories surfaced. I'm sorry but it's just overwhelming. Amo recalls when her parents, Walter and Verna Fontaine, started the team in the 70s on the Saiging First Nation in Manitoba. Oh, my dad, you know, he played hockey in residential school and, you know, he loved hockey. He was a great hockey man, you know, and uh, now I know why he wanted to do what he did and why my mom helped him. Both of them attended residential school. Walter played a number of positions anywhere he was needed. Verna raised money by running bingos to pay for the team's trips across North America and Europe. Most of the players were residential school survivors. Theodore Fontaine played defense. It's a long legacy of uh, denying uh, an identity and it was a, an opportunity to come up with the identity that we were real. You know, in, in spite of what government said that we were not, we were not real. So it was an opportunity to show us what, that we were normal and we could compete with the world. Former Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner Willie Littlechild also played for Seguin. I didn't expect to see myself in the Hall of Fame. Um, so it was exciting, it was emotional, but also a very historic moment in our lives as Indigenous peoples, not only as athletes but as communities, to have uh, a venue like the Hockey Hall of Fame display a part of our a part of our life, so it was really really exciting. Little child says he used sports to escape from his residential school abuse. The team of Saging, for example, is a very good positive illustration that you can use sport to heal our communities. You can use sport to bring people together. Some of the players have since passed but the spirit of the team lives on in Canada's Hockey Hall of Fame. It's very emotional. Um, it's very nice to see um, the stories behind the artifacts and what they mean and how that the Hockey Hall of Fame gets to preserve that. So it's not just the artifacts we preserve, it's the stories behind. Beverly Andrews, APT and National News, Toronto. A TSN feature titled The Unwanted Visitor highlights Ted Nolan's story of racism at the highest level of the game. Ted shares what happened during his time with the Buffalo Sabres and how a decision in the best interest of a player's health led to the fallout. Here's a little bit of that story. I never fell in love with the NHL. I fell in love with the game. There are two schools of thought on Ted Nolan. Some believe he is indeed being blacklisted. Others say Nolan has victimized himself. Name another coach in the history of sports that wins Coach of the Year and doesn't get hired for 10 years. Makes no sense. Nolan allows that the situation in Buffalo was quite strained. A bit of a GM killer. If 
I was born in Toronto and my skin was white, I'd be coaching. I'm trying to believe that prejudice wasn't a factor, but I'm concerned that it was. I've always felt unwanted, unwanted visitor in the, in the game. And that feeling of what racism really feels like, what uh, prejudice really feels like. And people could assume what it feels like, but unless you, you live it and you smell it and you see it, uh, you don't know what it's like. Ted Nolan in February when the feature The Unwanted Visitor aired on TSN. Ted is from Garden River First Nation in Ontario and he was drafted by and played for the, De for the Detroit Red Wings and the Pittsburgh Penguins. He also coached for the Buffalo Sabres and the, and the New York Islanders in the NHL. Now Ted talks about his story as a coach but his experience with racism started years prior as a player playing junior hockey at 16 years old. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't pretty. I, I left home when I was 16 years old. Uh, for, the, for a very first time to to try pursue uh, uh, pursue hockey, and that's when I really uh, racism really uh, slapped you right in, in the side of the head and, and really woke you up to, to realities. And, and I, I cried myself to sleep. And if you see that piece uh, about my my younger brother, how emotional he was, uh, it, it was hard. You know, we just lost my my father that year, uh, going to Kenora, uh, playing in the Manitoba Junior Hockey League. And um, him and his, uh, my older brother, uh, they came to town to, I thought, to watch me play. My, my first exhibition, but actually they, they came to bring me back home. Because uh, uh, when, when I did uh, make contact with back home through letters, and I was, I was you know, crying myself to sleep, uh, not, not liking the game anymore. And so when they came to town to bring me home, um, uh, I, I said no. So that was why he was so emotional. But it, it was a very, very tough year to, to get through. And tell you the truth, I, I don't really to remember too much about the hockey part. Now, Nolan was fired from the Buffalo Sabres in part to not playing star player Pat LaFontaine at the request of management. Now, LaFontaine was injured and Nolan did not want to play him at the cost of even more serious injury occurring. As a result, rumors started circulating about Nolan not listening to management and even drinking at practice, which is why he wanted to set the record straight. It was it was it was really important because a lot of people out there, you know, believe in believe in the rumors and 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 having a perception about who I who I was and, and what I did, and uh, especially the, the the drinking at uh, drunk at practice. I mean, how how disgusting that that is uh, to and people believing it and to. To saying that I was I was a GM killer and, and I and I disrespected the, um, I, I I take direction as, as well as anybody but the one thing I, I won't do is is jeopardize someone's life to to try to win a hockey game and, and that's exactly what happened with uh, with Pat Lafontaine uh, I mean he was a guy he was um, he wasn't right and so we we had a good discussion he started crying and and now. To, uh, to me, of all the coaching decisions I, I made in my life, uh, that was probably the best coaching decision I ever made. And, you know, maybe it, it cost me uh, that rumors uh, to say he's a GM killer, he won't listen to, to management, but people don't know the story. And, and now, uh, now they know, you know, with the drinking part, especially with how it relates to our people. Um, you know, some of the, the stories that our people had to go through with residential schools, and, and that terrific, horrific story. I mean, when, when I played my, my first game in the, uh, with the Detroit Red Wings, I, I still remember walking up those stairs because the, uh, the dressing room was in the basement. Kind of, you walk up in Chicago Stadium, the big organ, everything was so. I mean, it was it was incredible. And I remember having tears in my eyes. It wasn't tears of of sadness. It was tears of uh, of, of joy uh, uh, because you're. You know, you're playing, uh, the reason you're playing is um, a lot of the uh, sacrifices the, a lot of our people had to, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of our people had to go through in order for me to, to play a simple game. So so people don't understand that. So when, when they say those comments, it, 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 it's a little bit more uh, meaningful, a little bit more hurtful. hurtful. Now, Ted shared with me a story of meeting a young fan in an airport and realizing she knew the reason he was not coaching. 
He believes if more indigenous people were in higher level positions, that would translate to more players at higher levels as well. I, I, I think we need more people who look like us in, in positions of, uh, of coaching, of management, um, uh, scouting. You know, so so we we know it, and, and I, I told a story when I was uh, uh, with Rick Westhood for the first time, and I'll try not to be emotional about it, but uh, I think that was one of the, <clears throat> one of the stories that, that I mentioned to him. I was walking through the airport one day. Uh, you know, this is eight years after I was I was let go by the Sabers. Eight years, and and for a young girl, yeah, you know, she ran up to me in the airport, and she said, "Hey, coach, coach." And, uh, and she wanted to take a picture and her parents came there. And uh, so we took a picture and she, uh, she, uh, I, I, she said, I know why you're not coaching. And I said, why am I not coaching? He said, because your skin is too brown. And I mean, this was a young, uh, uh, a, a young girl and so how do you uh, how, how do you reply to that? And uh, you, you you say no, that's not the reason. There's other reasons, but uh, you just keep believing. So, anyways, long story short, I, I met that young lady um, when I was coaching uh, New York Islanders, and she said, "I know why you're coaching again because your skin is brown." So, but it it does it it it's it's hurtful. It it, uh, uh, it scars people. So I just think. Um, for people to be a little bit more understanding and uh, and uh, we're, we're good people and that's that's uh, and, and we do have some some people with some some skill that should be playing the game at a higher level now i asked ted what his favorite part of coaching is and while winning was one of them it wasn't what he enjoyed most about it he said it's the relationships with his players and seeing how they grow as people he also touched on how important the game of hockey is, not just for the sport aspect, but life lessons it can teach as well. You would think it would be winning championships, but not not so much. It, uh, it's uh, the relationship that you create with your your players and some of the because uh, when I when I coached when when I played, uh, you know, the, I felt that the coaches always they always uh, lean towards the, the star players. And the star players could do no wrong. They could turn the puck over. They could uh, have a giveaway. They could uh, uh, not back check so hard, but they keep playing them. And then as a fourth line guy, third line guy, you turn the puck over one time. I mean, you're you're done. You, you don't get to play out there. So I really, I was more of a coach for those guys, and uh, because I was one of them. So um, so to all the all the all the people out there, just uh, just be more understanding of that uh, and. When it's all said and done, I mean, uh, it, after all, it's just a game. It really is just a game. And uh, but that game has such a powerful impact on on kids' lives uh, in order to pursue other other avenues in life. Not everybody's going to be a professional athlete, but they could certainly go to school and, and learn different professions and, and you know uh, be a reporter on APTN. You know, be uh, be a doctor, be a lawyer. I mean, there's all kinds of. But if the kids don't get to see that, uh, uh, it's hard for them to believe it. So the, the biggest thing that I got out of it is when I was standing on a bench, um, that the kids got to got to see one of their own. Now, Ted and his two sons, Jordan and Brandon, also run their own hockey camp, primarily in First Nation communities, and they have a clothing line called Three Nolans. Now, Ted said working with his two boys is the best job he's ever had, and the lessons they teach are a direct result of the experiences they all have faced. I, I still remember um, how this whole thing started back in the day. I, I, I created a, a Nishinaabe hockey school, and we went to different uh, communities, and, and we did it uh, ever since I, I played that or coached that first game in, in Buffalo, and my name started getting out there a little bit more, so I really wanted to give back. So we started the school, and then when I had kids, uh, obviously, I couldn't go out as much as I, I used to, so we kind of let that slide. And then Brandon, uh, he went after his uh, head concussion. Uh, he went back to university and got his business degree and, and so forth. And and uh, he started looking at some of the, the old things. He said, hey, Dad, so what do you think about uh, opening up a, a hockey school? Uh, three of us, we get to – so I, I thought – so I had a lot of jobs in my life, uh, 
But I tell you, this this working with my two sons is probably the, the best job I've ever had in my entire life. So we started the, the, the three Nolans. And uh, we go into uh, 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 particularly First Nation communities and have uh, hockey schools of, of high-end caliber, uh, not uh, just put the kids on the ice. We try to teach them what it, what it really is. And we talk to the – we have a parent session. We talk to the kids and the parents about some of the obstacles that they, they may face when leaving home. We talk about some of the decisions that they have to make for substance abuses and, and so forth and nutrition. And, 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 and I guess the, the bottom line is, is about uh, perseverance about sticking through it because both my sons, uh, I remember Brandon, I mean, he was, he was crying himself to sleep as I did when I was 16 when leaving home because it's tough leaving home. But if you want to pursue uh, certain things, you have to, you have to do that. So in Jordan it was the same thing. He, he cried, but I uh, guess what, in the summertime when hockey's all over, we're all back together doing what we do. And thank you to Ted for taking the time to chat with me. If you would like to see the full feature, The Unwanted Visitor, you can visit the TSN website at tsn.ca. And sadly, we lost one of our great athletes last year. One of the first Indigenous players to play in the NHL, Fred Sasakamus, was a pioneer for the game of hockey, and his death was felt by many. Here's more on the impact he had and the legacy he leaves behind. The death of Fred Sasakamus from COVID-19 struck a chord, and many people took to social media to express their condolences. NHL teams, former players, politicians all expressed their grief for one of the first Indigenous players in NHL history. Steve Hogel is the former Saskatoon Blades president and was a friend of Sasakamus. Uh, wherever I went with him or if I was having a coffee with him, people would come up and talk to him and... You just had to love the way he rolled, and uh, he always put others first. And and um, even though he had he had led this legendary life and had created such an amazing history, he was always about looking forward and thinking about that younger generation and taking care of the kids. So uh, he sets a wonderful example for us, uh, and and will forevermore. Sasakamus was a residential school survivor who grew up in Atakakoop Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. He made his NHL debut November the 20th, 1953, against the Boston Bruins as a member of the Chicago Blackhawks. After hockey, he started a national hockey championship to allow Indigenous hockey athletes to showcase their talents. He also became a band counselor of his home Atakakoop Cree Nation, serving many years and spent six years as chief. In 2017, Sasakamus was invested in the Order of Canada, an honor that recognizes Canadian citizens for outstanding achievement, dedication to community, or service to the nation. He, he believed in his, uh, in his culture, his language, his people. He believed in us getting along with uh, non-native people, races around the world. Uh, he, he believed in a lot of good qualities of what we should be striving for. He inspired many Indigenous hockey players after him, such as Manitoba's Reggie Leach, among others. Fred Sasakamus was 86 years old. Now we do have to take a short break, but later in the show, former UFC flyweight champion Nico Montagna will join me. And coming up after the break, the two winners of the Tom Longboat Award in 2017. What are they up to now? Stay with us to find out. Join our conversation now. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page, follow or tweet us at APTN in Focus, and send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Welcome back to a special sport episode of In Focus. If you have questions or comments, you can call call us toll free at one eight seven seven. 647-2798. Now joining me now is James Lavallee and Joy Spearchief Morris. James is a Métis sprint kayaker and advocate from here in Winnipeg. Joy is an Indigenous black hur hurdler, writer and advocate and is a member of the Kainai Blood Tribe in Alberta. Now the pair are the recipients of the 2017 Tom Longbow Awards which recognizes uh, Aboriginal athletes for their contributions in sports. Now, James, Joy, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the award in 2017 and, and what it meant to receive that? Joy, let's start with you. Um, yeah, so 
It was um, it was really cool to see that. Um, I know that the award honors um, Tom Longboat, who is a distance runner, who's from that area um, near where I am right now. Um, I believe from Six Nations, on Nevada. Right, right on. Um, uh, but the the call and... drop is the only thing. So oh. Oh, I think we're just having a little technical difficulty there. Sorry. Continue, Joy. Um, yeah, and. Um, it was just um, really cool to be recognized for the accomplishments that I had um, done up until that time um, and to receive it with James. It was um, a really cool honor and to receive it as a Canadian um, Sports Hall of Fame was also a really, really big deal and it was a really cool experience. So Joy, what changed for you since winning that award in, in 2017? Um, a lot of things. Um, at the time of the award, I was living in uh, Santa Barbara, California. I was training full time um, to make the Tokyo Olympic Games. Um, I ended up realizing that I was not in the right place for me training wise. So I moved back to London, Ontario. I've been training full time since then. Um, I've also been working full time. I completed a master's degree. Um, yeah, a lot of things and still training for um, the Olympics, hoping to qualify for the Olympics this summer, and yeah. <laughs> so James, we'll, we'll hop over to you. What, what's changed in your time since you, know, you won that award in 2017? Uh, quite a bit, I guess. I've, um, I have retired from the sport, um, and now I'm, uh, I started a nonprofit called Waterways Recreation. And so we offer uh, programs to Indigenous youth to get back on the water, canoeing, and uh, connecting with the land and exploring their identities. Um, and I've also started going to school. So that's, uh, that's where I've been. You guys are both doing great work afterwards. And uh, Joy, you're also involved with the Indigenous Student Centre at Western University as, as the Students Opportunities Coordinator, right? So uh, what are some of the things you do there? Um, so I've had a few different kind of positions with the Indigenous Student Centre over the last two and a half years. Um, currently my role is in charge of um, kind of some student planning and events. I organized the Indigenous Awareness Week this past year, which was a campus-wide initiative um, that was bringing, uh, bringing awareness to Indigenous students and issues on campus, but also really celebrating Indigenous students and the work that we do. Um, I've done quite a few things with the Centre. I to do some communications work. I've also been involved in the Indigenous Youth Track and Field Day for the last couple of years. It's a really cool um, outreach program that we do. So why was working there something that, that you wanted to do? I originally got into working there after I moved back to London in 2018. Um, I'm a Western graduate um, and I had worked on the Indigenous Youth Track and Field program back in um, my undergrad and I just knew that I wanted to be involved with it. I had all these ideas and things that I thought could make it so so unique and so important, e even more important than it already was. And um, I guess I had a really good sales pitch because they hired me and I've been I've been working there since. So, so James, you're a, a kayaker and you know, you started a program called uh, Waterways Recreation. Um, it it's a it helps, you know, youth learn traditional skills at a, at a canoe camp. How, how did all that get started? Um, well, really, like, throughout my, my career paddling, um, I realized that, you know, there's not a lot of uh, Indigenous youth at, in, in the sport. Um, and so I always kind of felt that, you know, maybe my, my true calling was to, um, to be creating those opportunities for Indigenous youth and for Indigenous peoples to get back out there on the water. Um, uh, yeah, so that's I, in 2019. I decided that was going to be my last year, and I, I um, knew a few others that had also been thinking of kind of starting a similar initiative. So we got together, um, roped in my dad, and we just went for it. And in 2020, we had our first season. We worked with eight different uh, uh, Manishinaabe communities in southeastern Manitoba, and they all had uh, two weeks of summer camp. So we're looking to expand that um, in 2021. So like, how are you planning on expanding? Like, what are your numbers looking like uh, upcoming for this summer? For this summer, uh, you know, things are still up in the air with um, COVID. We never know, hopefully there's
Oh, I think we're having a little bit of uh, technical difficulty again here sure. with, with James. And uh, Joy, we'll just jump over to you here a little bit. Um, you, you're a 100 meter hurdler and, and you've been training for the Tokyo Olympics. So what's your kind of training schedule like on a day to day basis? So with COVID right now, it does not look like how it used to. Um, I've actually been dealing with a couple of injuries as well, so it's a little bit more adapted right now. But um, I'm usually on the track or um, doing some sort of track-like workout uh, three, four times a week. And then I, um, I lift twice a week. I get um, some recovery days in between there because those are you know just as important as what I do, but I have a couple of days a week where I focus on um, my hurdle technique, a couple of days I work work on speed, speed endurance, um, and then um, lifting and the rest is all kind of, you know, everything that is off the track, all the recovery work I do, the physio I um, take care of. Um, I'm always, I have a lot of appointments, even though I work full time right now, so I balance that along with training full time. So my schedule is always um, a very large color coded mess of trying to manage all of my training sessions and my meetings and appointments, physio and all of it. <laughs> so what's next for, for the Olympics? Uh, like, what's the next competition for you to, to try and get there? So it's an interesting year, um, even this past year. Usually around this time, I'd be getting ready to go down to a training camp in California for all of April. Um, with COVID restrictions and travel restrictions, that's just not um, a possibility for me this year. So I'm looking at competing outdoors beginning in May, and they're going to be mainly local in Ontario. I'm really hoping I can find some meets, um, some high, high quality elite meets across Canada. Um, hopefully, I'll make it out west for a couple of meets as well. And then Olympic trials are in June and at the end of June in Montreal. And James, I just want to hop back to you, and, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of go back to, to waterways here. So. What's this summer looking like for you and uh, how many communities and how many kids are, are you looking at this year? Yeah, we're looking to uh, be in all the communities that we were, were last year. And we were talking with uh, a few for a few parts of the MMF um, are also interested as well. Uh, but one of the things we're really excited about is working in Blood Vein. We're actually gonna have a, a six month program um, that uh, is supposed to be in conjunction with the school and with Southeast CFS and then the school again in the fall. So it's really a, kind of our ideal model that we can incorporate a lot more over that time frame, like rice harvesting, fishing, um, uh, just on top of the canoeing aspect as well. So how can somebody get involved if they wanted to help out with the program or funding or anything like that? How do people get involved? Um, well, actually, right now we're hiring for program leads uh, and uh, admin assistants and stuff like that. So they should all check out our website um, at uh, waterwayscanada.com. Look at our job opportunities, and we're also looking to bring on a, a new board member. Um, so if anyone's looking to kind of get involved, maybe volunteer or work for the summer, uh, there's lots of opportunities coming up in 2021. Perfect. And uh, with Sorry, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to Joy here. Um, you know, w with the pandemic, traditional sports have been shut down for uh, the most part because of because of you know closures and pools and, and what have you. So, um, what kind of advice do you have for people to stay active as a runner? That's not something that uh, you know people need necessarily need to go to a center for. Yeah. So um, with my sport, particularly because I hurdle and train on track, I have not had access to a track facility in over a year um i've been training this winter we've been training out of an ice rink where we put down a couple layers of track and have just made it work so really that's the only advice i can say is um you make it work i all summer i did um four circuits with my dad on zoom from my apartment <laughs> so he, he trained me over the summer from my apartment um you know you just make it work i did runs on the paths that were near my house you don't um you really don't need a lot of equipment or a lot I've learned to make things work, especially with having to do a lot of modified training as I've done this year. You can make a lot of things work um, wherever you are. I think it's just a matter of being creative and finding the motivation to make um, any situation you're in the best situation you can be in. So Joy, what's next for you, uh, you know, once the Olympic trials are done? And so what's your next steps here in the, in the near future? 
Um, so I've been looking at doing some career changes as well. I've been looking at moving more into journalism, and I really want to do more with my writing. So I'm looking at um, focusing more on that after um, the summer of computing. Well, if you wanted to get into journalism, I know APTN is a, is a great spot for that. <laughs> so I know we're, we'd love to have you over here. And, uh, you know, over to James now. James, you're, what you do is COVID-friendly as well, right? Like canoeing and kayaking. You don't really need uh, a center to do that. Yeah, we've been really fortunate. To, uh, you know, it's outside, eh? And um, we get the perfect two meters when you're sitting in someone with a canoe. So um, that that's just awesome. Um, and we're able to follow restrictions pretty easily because every, like I said, everything's outside, and we can sanitize everything that needs to be sanitized and wear masks when we need to wear masks. So it hasn't been an issue so far. So how does somebody get into canoeing and, and kayaking? It's not your most traditional sport, and, and you can't really do it on ice so how, how does how, how did you get into it and how how are you trying to get other kids into it yeah for me when i started um you know i i tried a lot of different sports nothing really clicked but i knew i loved to be outside um so i ended up finding the manitoba canoe kayak center in winnipeg and um fell in love with the sport and uh went from there uh Throughout Manitoba, there's lots of different clubs through the Manitoba Paddling Association, but also um, if your community is looking for paddling programs but you don't know where to start, you should give uh, Waterways a call because that's uh, we're, we're here for that. We're here to help make paddling uh, programs happen wherever they need to be. So are you, would you be looking at expanding outside of Manitoba? Uh, like, is that, a, is that a goal for Waterways in the future? I, I believe in the future it is. Um, right now we want to make sure that we we're able to uh, support uh, Indigenous communities in Manitoba the best we can, and we don't want to expand out uh, too fast. Um, but we have had some interest from communities uh, just in Ontario and Chill Lake there. Um, so, you know, it, it looks like there there's possibilities that that'll happen in a few years, yeah. So what would you need for that to happen? Uh, for that to happen? Well, it... Um, Funding is always uh, always the first thing. Um, you know, we need to be able to have someone that can. Right now, we don't have someone that works all year. It's just a volunteer board that is organizing everything behind the scenes. So we kind of need to get to a level where we have a full-time staff member that can coordinate uh, programs throughout the year and get ready for the springtime um, and write grants and make sure things are affordable for communities and organizations that want to be paddling and uh, need someone to help them get started. Now, this question's for both of you, but I'll, I'll jump over to Joy here. Um, how important is your, is your heritage to you? Like, what are some of the things that you're doing to showcase who you are and, and where you're from? Uh, good question. I think it's, my heritage is really my identity and it's it's really it's what you see when you look at me it's it's what you see when i'm when i'm out on racing so i think i've made the decision to um be very vocal and visible about you know who i am in my identity as an indigenous woman as a black woman um and you know be that person be that role model for whoever needs it um whether or not anyone is actually watching or not but you know, if there's um, a young girl or a, a young boy out there who didn't know that they could be an Indigenous athlete at the level that I run, then now they know, and now they know that they can do that or whatever they're doing. So I think it's really important to have that representation um, on all levels, I think especially in sport. We don't see it enough, um, and I think um, it's just, and it's, it was important to me because I didn't have that growing up, and so I have made kind of the decision to be that person that I kind of wish I had more. And, and James, the same question over to you. We got about uh, 40 seconds here. So how, how important is your heritage to you? Uh, I think it's a defining element of my life and, uh, you know, and how it's how I identify, how I carry myself every day. But it's also what motivates me to, to provide opportunities for Indigenous youth, for Métis youth, um, and just to, uh, it, it, it gets me up in the morning and I, I feel responsible to um, uh, to create opportunities for um, for Indigenous people. All right, well, Joy, James, I want to thank the both of you for joining me here. Um, 
thank you for bearing with us through some of the technical difficulties, but uh, you guys are both doing great work, and hopefully we can have you on some show in the future, and uh, I, just, I just can't thank you guys enough for being on the show. Well done. Yeah, thank you. thanks for having us. Now, James Lavely spoke of the Waterways uh, Canada project. Now let's take a look back to the summer of 2020 when the program was just getting started. The not-for-profit organization focuses on Indigenous youth and communities in Manitoba. Waterways Recreation is using paddling-based programs to connect Indigenous youth with their land and water. The program will run in nine First Nation communities in Manitoba, three of those being fly-in. Instructors will teach members of the community how to run the program so they can be self-sufficient. It's an opportunity for them to uh, get outside, um, experience their wilderness, and in a lot of these communities we're you know, engaging elders and community leaders to help provide a cultural aspect to the programming. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we really want to provide an opportunity um, for recreation for these kids. Um, and, you know, if it, we believe that this is the kind of uh, programming that improves uh, mental and physical health, and, and that's our goal at the end of the day. The COVID-19 pandemic delayed the launch of the program, but Manitoba's low COVID-19 numbers made it possible for the program to reach Indigenous communities. James Lavallee is a former kayak sprinter for Team Canada. He walked away from the sport to devote his time to this project. I enjoyed that for a long period of time, but for me it just came to the point where I would much rather be dedicating that same effort to creating opportunities for other Indigenous youth. Um, and that's ultimately what pushed me uh, to decide to retire or, or end my career in competitive paddling, um, but to start something new and create more opportunities for other people. Lavely also added that paddling helped him discover more about his Métis heritage, something he hopes other Indigenous kids will find with this program. This kind of programming um, where we're getting Indigenous youth out, active, healthy, having fun, doing these positive moments are all connected to uh, to their culture at the, same, at the same time. So all our programs are designed to be specific and built in collaboration with the communities. So we really can build in and enhance that cultural benefit uh, while these athletes are, are athletes, uh, while these youth are getting that, uh, the physical aspects as well. Programming has been confirmed for 1,000 youth this summer. The organization hopes to find more funding to be able to facilitate programs in Métis, Inuit, and other First Nations communities. Take one more break, but on the other side, UFC fighter Nico Montagna will join me. We'll discuss what's next for her professionally and how she's trying to give back to the Navajo Nation during the pandemic. Stay with us. Welcome back. Joining me now is the UFC's first ever women's flyweight champion, Nico Montano. Montano is part Navajo and part Chickasaw and was raised in the Navajo Nation. Her UFC flyweight title came as part of the Ultimate Fighter 26, and she is also trying to help out the Navajo Nation with a new utility business. Nico, thank you so much for joining me here on In Focus. Uh, I want to start with the day you won the UFC Flyweight Championship, which was uh, part of the Ultimate Fighter 26. What were your thoughts then, and, and how often do you look back on it now? Uh, my thoughts then were, you know, I was just pretty proud of myself because I was able to put uh, Navajo Nation on the map and be able to bring awareness to, you know, our hardships and how we overcame everything. Um, including genocide but yeah i mean that was my motivation from the get-go was just bringing awareness to my people and showing that my people you know are are uh are able to bring so much to the table and i want them to know that if i can do it they can do it also now your dad was a fighter as well did you always want to fight or was it something you kind of found later in life and, and what is it that you like about fighting no, actually, I didn't really want to fight. Um, I didn't want to get punched in the head. Um, I got into jujitsu initially for self-defense reasons because I was going to college um, all by myself. I graduated high school at 17, so I went to college at 17, and I just wanted to be able to you know, feel confident walking down the street. Um, so I started doing jujitsu, and then I started doing jujitsu comps, and then I started winning those competitions. And then the trainers and my coaches that I was... Um, 
uh, training with out in Durango were like, maybe you should try a fight. And I was like, I don't want to. And they're like, you don't even have to get punched. Look at Ronda Rousey. She was a big name then. And I was like, all right, all right, I'll try it. And sure enough, my first five amateur, well, all of my amateur fights, all five of them ended in the first round. I probably got punched twice at most in a, in a fight. So I just figured, let's see how far I can take it. So how important is your Navajo and, and Chickasaw heritage to you? Uh, what are some of the things you're doing to showcase who you are and, and where you're from? Um, right now, I'm going around to some native um, villages and native reses and teaching self-defense and um, anti-bullying for children, self-defense for women. could be for, you know, a co-ed, but, uh, you know, that's what originally drew me into my fighting career, that I want to be able to share that with everyone. And I know my Navajo Nation um, on the Navajo Reservation, we're having, we got hit pretty hard with COVID. so. Just keeping morale up is going to be a task in itself and being able to like bring the community get together so that we can unify once again and uh, overcome another hardship you know it's not impossible it's something that we've always done so i know we i just i just need to keep morale up and i'm going to be um starting my my uh utilities business there so eventually you know my my wish is to have everybody have running water so everybody feels safe and everyone can you know live as more so a sanitary lifestyle, but you know, washing your hands <laughs> diligently is kind of a preventative issue at this point. So nutrition is, is a very important uh, part of anybody's life, but how much more important is it when, when you're a fighter, for example, when you're weight cutting and, and things like that? Uh, and are traditional foods a, a part of your diet? Yeah, you know, it's, it's pretty hard because traditional foods, there's a lot of corn in it uh, and <laughs> carbs are bad, but, um, Anything naturally grown is uh, is something that is definitely on my slate. Um, I like to travel and get my own protein, go on hunts and um, send out for, you know, get my own protein, mail it back to myself, just so I know where it's coming from and I know that it came from the intention of using the entire animal and, um, you know, being grateful for the food that it's, it's given me and so I don't have to feel guilty eating anything else <laughs> and I guess in a sense in the traditional aspect that's uh, you know that's helped me through all of this and you know keeping my diet pretty clean whenever I have to drop weight for camp and do you have a favorite Navajo recipe uh, it's gonna have to be the Navajo taco but fried bread isn't necessarily a uh, is uh, <laughs> not very keto <laughs> So what would you say to, you know, to an indigenous youth who, who might want to be an athlete or they're, they're trying to find out what they want to do? What's your message to them? You know, I'd say do a lot of uh, internal research and figure out what truly motivates them and see what the passion really is. I think a lot of my finding and what my passion, what motivates me, i.e. my people, my Navajo, the Navajo Nation and the youth especially, just everybody who doesn't have a voice you know i have a platform now i grew up playing with rocks and sticks and now i can speak for the same people growing up in the same situations um i think that they should be you know really in tune with themselves wake up in the morning use every part of the day uh don't be distracted with anything that's going to take them out of focus and uh, really just hone in on who they are and what really motivates them now, have you had any youth reach out to you about, you know, maybe they want to start jiu-jitsu or, you know, MMA or anything like that? Have you had any youth reach out to you about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's part of the workshops, too. You know, a lot of self-defense, like I said, is implemented through jiu-jitsu. So it ties into that. And then, you know, a lot of kids just like doing tumbles and airplane rides, and that's all tomonage and break falls. So it's uh it's all implemented and they have a lot of fun with it there's plenty of fighters i mean there's plenty of kids who want to become fighters but you know the understanding of if i'm teaching you these things you're going to be walking around with like a double-edged sword so understanding that it takes some responsibility uh, behind it all so what's next for you in, in your fighting career do you have any you know fights planned for this year coming up right now now I'm still not cleared. I uh, got rear-ended December 1st, and that's why I had to pull out of my last fight. I think I have about another half a month or so before I'm cleared um, because I got a concussion. 
So it's, you know, it's a kind of like a day by day process. It's not like when I had my MCL tear, when it was like, okay, you have X amount of weeks before it's healed. Um, with a concussion, it's kind of different, but I mean, my, my goal is always to be, be the champ. And now that I'm at 135, that's what I'm going to keep chipping away at. So what goes into, um, you know, a, a fight camp? Can you let our viewers in on, on how exactly you would prepare for an upcoming fight? Yeah, I would, um, so I'd move to, i go to Vegas. I already moved to Vegas, but, you know, I'm traveling around right now, reaching out to indigenous youth uh, is my priority out of camp. So when I'm in camp, I go back to Vegas. I train at Syndicate, probably about four hours a day, have PT about two hours a day, uh, recovery is necessary, um, prep for food is necessary so that once you get done with the workout and you're starving, you don't reach for the quickest thing, which is going to be some sort of candy bar or, you know, like protein bar that's filled with a bunch of fillers and not even technically nutrients. So a lot of prepping for snacks and food. Um, and then just staying on my focus, you know, staying on my grind, going to bed early, waking up with the sun making sure I'm doing my part and being honest about my efforts. So have you thought about what you might want to do, you know, when your fighting career is done and, and maybe what you might want to do after? Yeah, um, I, you know, I think mostly everybody knows that you can't be an athlete for forever, especially a fighter, especially a fighter with concussions. <laughs> um, so, you know, these workshops that I'm doing with Indigenous youth and um, the indigenous peoples is something that I, it's, you know, my, my passion and my motivation for my people to help my people ties into that. And that's what motivates me through my fighting. And that's what's motivating me through these workshops now. And so with this, I mean, there's no end to it. You know, I'm always going to find a way to reach out and make sure the community is, is, uh, happy by the time I leave, you know, as soon as I get there I, and by the time I leave, I want them to say, come back and, you know, help us out some more, teach us the tools to keep in unity. Now, Nico, you mentioned a, a utility business. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. So with the utilities business, I um, partnered up with my um, my manager, my fight manager, Ricky Constetti, and we're working just to improve, uh, um, for lack of better terms, right, improve the Navajo Nation in terms of running water and sewage and just everything, Wi-Fi, making, because right now everybody, my sister included, has to be in school via online. And the Wi-Fi, if, if you know how the res works or you know how Village <laughs> works, Wi-Fi can be kind of uh, not so consistent. So we're gonna be, you know, working on that, making sure everybody has the same um, basic uh, essentials you know it's a luxury for us on the res to have these things and I think nobody really understands that um, that it is <laughs> oh that sounds awesome I'm sure that's much needed and so you also coach right so what are the, some of the things you try to teach when you're coaching and and you know what is it about the coaching aspect that you like as, as opposed to you know being in the fight um, you know coaching able to when I'm fighting, I'm able to get people riled up. I'm able to be on that platform with my mic in my hand and speaking my native tongue and, you know, getting everybody who's watching TV fired up. And without these fights, it, I kind of feel helpless in that sense. So with these workshops and with me coaching, I'm able to be one-on-one -on -one with them and see them face to face. They be more personal and ask where they're coming from and they can, under, they can ask me personal questions. You know, and it's just a more vulnerable place for both of us to uh, to learn, especially with the kids, especially with the youth or somebody who's super shy and not comfortable, but they recognize me. I'm a familiar face, so they, they feel comfortable enough to come up to me and tell me what they're dealing with in school or at home. And I'm able to, you know, put a smile on their face and let them know that I came from the same place and they can do exactly the same thing that I did if they just keep focused and do what they want to do, you know, keep their dreams alive. Well, it sounds like you got a lot going on, and hopefully your concussion gets cleared and we can see you fighting. But, uh, Nico, I just want to thank you again for coming on to the show, and, and good luck with all your future endeavors. And hopefully we can talk to you uh, in the future. Yeah, yeah, I would love to. You know, I love, like I said, any way that I can reach out to 
my indigenous peoples. It'll be fun. I, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy learning from everybody in different cultures and sharing my information, my, my culture. Perfect. And it's always nice to, to have a chat with our uh, southern cousins. We enjoy talking to them, and, and uh, I just can't thank you enough again. I appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon. Well, that's going to be all for this special sports edition of In Focus. Thank you again to all of our guests today for joining, as well as you, the viewers. This episode will be available for download as a podcast on our website at aptnnews.ca backslash podcast. And if you missed any of the shows and you want to catch up, you can check out the website aptnnews.ca. Melissa Ridgen will be back in the chair next week talking about Inuit art and life on the land. I'm Daryl Stranger. Have a great afternoon.